Freedom's the answer. What's the question? You're listening to Ernest Hancock. It ain't so groovy when you're screaming in the night. Let me out of this cheap B movie. Head long down the highway and you rush it head long out of control. And you think you're so strong, but there ain't no stopping. And you can't stop rocking. And there's nothing you can, nothing you can, nothing you can do about it. Yeah, you can complain, complain, and can educate. Well, that's exactly what happened. Adam Coke Cash, Drew Phillips, Nick Barnett, Thomas Costanzo. Man, I couldn't think of the the four horsemen of the apocalypse descending the on us. Uh, I just, I'm going, man, did they get their dose. You know, who was the, uh, did everybody have a talk? I mean, because once you get Thomas going, he can't shut up. I mean, you know, so who was doing most of the negotiating? Uh, well, it got to a point pretty quickly where all Thomas was doing was praying. Um, but there was, a, there was a moment before that when uh, they were rifling through all of the gear that they had brought for the conference and were going through copies of Police State 4 and Bogged Constitution. And while they're going through Tom's bag with the Constitution, he yells, hey, you can take one of those. And I wanted to be like, yeah, you should try reading the Fourth Amendment. You'd really love it. But uh, as it was, they, they had me separated. And, and you know, in a, in a normal situation like this or, in, you know, any other situation, I, I think they would have at least gone to the point that they did where they said, all right, we're going to call BP or DPS, right, Department of Public Safety. Great oxymoronic name for your catch-all Phoenix government agency for oppressing people. Highway Patrol. And, <laughs> yeah, so they said, and then they'll either send out a state cop or a county cop or a local cop, and they can respond to this, you know, how how they see fit, and they'll do their thing. And before we got to that point, I was talking to the, this officer in, in in charge of the stop, and uh, the other one that was with him, who was the Iraq veteran, the former Marine. And he said, "Hey, man, I pulled you over." And I saw your Marine Corps play. I thought everything was going to be cool. How come you didn't just, like, voluntarily give up all your rights and, you know, bend over and submit? Aren't you a good Marine? Don't you know that's how it's supposed to work and respect authority and all that? And I was just like, face palm moment. But instead, I collected myself and took a different tack on things, and I told them a little story. I said, well, it was a bit of an exchange, and, and I was going to know the guy a little bit and hear about his story. And he says, um... First of all, hey, this checkpoint is, is completely legal. This is as legal as it gets. You know, hey, our, our Supreme Court, Constitution, and I was like, okay, but you're appealing to authority here. And as someone who is a arbiter of government violence, you are the one carrying a gun here with the social sanction of using violence against people. I would hope that you would ex- exercise a, a greater responsibility to appeal to your own conscience and to what is morally right and sound, as opposed to an appeal to authority. If the end of your conversation, the end of your argument is some other group of people said it was okay, you have no moral ground to stand on. And I think that resonated with him for a moment, at least got him into a different way of thinking. And then he said, well, come on, man, I was a good Marine. Weren't you a good Marine? You did everything you could to be a good Marine, right? We're here just doing our job. And I maintain my respect. And I think in, in situations like this, and in general, I think a, a good attitude to maintain is this is a messed up system, but these aren't messed up people any more than everybody else in society. And they are still beautiful human beings deserving of our respect and our love as fellow human beings. And you don't have to cross that line at any point in dealing with law enforcement under any circumstance. It doesn't mean you don't stand up for yourself. It doesn't mean you don't defend yourself. There's no excuse not to be courteous. There's no reason to deny someone else of their humanity. And so I, I, I went out of my way, I think, in, in the course of this conversation to do that and to make it clear. And I actually said in, in not so many words that that's what I was doing. You know, uh, they, you know they're saying things like, well, shouldn't you respect our authority and the job we're doing? And I said, look, listen, gentlemen, I can separate these things. I respect you as human beings. I respect who you are. I put the uniform on myself one day, and I respect the reasons for which you put on a uniform. That does not make the authority that is being exercised here legitimate. That does not mean that you have a moral superiority. That does not mean you have license to do whatever you want because you have a uniform on 
at this moment, and I do not. And probably in a slightly more drawn out, more respectful manner, but I made that point clear. And this Marine said to me while we were, they were deciding about the process, didn't you always try to be a good Marine? And I said, yeah. And you know what? I am. There were, there were times I regretted it. There yeah. were times I regretted I tortured detainees. And I did it to be a good Marine. And he said, well, did you get in trouble? And I said, no. I told you I did it to be a good Marine. It was what was expected of me by my superiors at the time. And I did it to be a good Marine. And I regret it. Does the uh, DPS actually come? Did they, you know, or they just kind of bypass that part? The supervisors had left by then, and there were only three officers with us. Those two that I was talking to, one that was watching over the uh, the other three because they had them separated from me. And the supervisors had gone, things had relaxed a little bit, and it's a sort of like, okay, we've done the search, we've harassed them adequately, identified that they're not really a threat, and despite that they're armed, and uh, it, it got kind of relaxed there for a second. I said, all right, so here's what's going to happen. We have to call DPS, and it's up to them. They're going to send, send a state, local, county cop, and uh, or not. It's up to them. And it may be that we just got lucky. It may be that they just decided not to respond. However, if they had responded, they would have faced something really interesting. One of the other things I did was to make it look like uh, I was happy and jovial through the whole situation. I actually was. I thought it was kind of fun. Um, but also to make it look like if they arrest me, they're doing me a favor. Oh, I get to test the reciprocity clause of the Arizona State New Medical Marijuana Law? Awesome. Oh, you're going to, oh, really? You want to arrest me for legal gun ownership? Oh, we're going to have fun with this. You know, maybe without being as over the top like that. But if you can portray that to an officer, it does change the psychological dynamic of the interaction. But did anybody know, bit. I mean, being Marines and so on, I would imagine that somebody had recognized you or might have heard your well, name or you came up on some list or something. There, there was there was one, that third cop who was there, or the third BTS or Border Patrol agent who was there, uh, said, hey, man, haven't I seen you on YouTube or something? <laughs> and and I was and, and it's like yeah, it happened to me at, at TSA checkpoints. And I was like, yeah, there was that one time I was on YouTube, and I didn't know if that was like, hey, I know this guy. This guy's cool. I like what he does. You know, I like his activism. By the way, don't call a DPS. Just tell the supervisor that you called DPS and stand around here for ten minutes, and then we'll let them go. Well, and I'd like I, to think that's what happened. <laughs> I mean, you guys, uh, you feel like uh, you're a little bit lucky or this could be, you know, how it's done in the future. I mean, do you think you get the same experience? No, next time? Well, you know, it's, it's one thing for a group of freedom activists who can get away with living like government doesn't exist and can talk their way out of any situation. But you know what really pisses me off? The next guy, the next citizen that goes through that situation might not be a Marine and might not be so lucky. In the arbitrary nature of this means there's no justice. Arbitrary nature means there's no justice. I couldn't put it better. Adam Kokesh, say hey to the guys for me. We look forward to hearing your story when you guys come back next week. Good luck, man. Thanks, Ernie. Thanks, Adam. We'll be right back here with Gene Manwiller in just a little bit.